And now let's see what happens. Oh, see? The, gra the graph looks much more bell-shaped, much more normal. That means the mean of all these proportions, the center of this graph, notice the computer says 0.276, is very close to the actual population parameter. So again, the center of the sampling distribution gives us the population parameter. And the standard error also will be pretty accurate because this is normal. So again, central limit theorem is all about when, what does it take to make my sampling distribution look normal. Okay, let's get back to our review sheet here. Um, so, uh, sam so what we learned also was that the random samples are different, right? That's called sampling variability. Every time we take a random sample, we get a different values and we get different statistics. So you could take a random sample from a population and calculate a proportion and take another random sample 10 seconds later from the same population, you're going to get something totally different. And that's really what the sampling distribution also shows us. Now this can be a problem because out in the world we usually just have one random sample. So usually you don't have enough money or, or resources to take um, a census and you don't have enough to take actually a, um, a, um, a, a thousand random samples. So usually we're lucky if we get one random sample, right? That's about all we have. So a lot of this stuff that we learn in this chapter is about what do I do if I only have one random sample? Well, one thing, the first thing people do often is they, they take, they say what's called a point estimate. Point estimate means they, they don't know what the population parameter is. They don't know what the population mean is. All they have is a random sample mean. So they just tell you that the sample mean is the population mean. Now, what we learned from our principle of sampling variability is that's not very, that's not actually true. Uh, the sample mean is going to be very far off from the population mean. I mean, it might be in the ballpark, but it's still going to be off. So you have to be aware that when most people out in the world, when they tell you they think they know, I don't know, the average salary of everybody in the United States, they probably don't. They're just taking a sample mean or a sample average and then just telling you it's the population average. That prints, that's called a point estimate. It's very confusing because a lot of people believe them. You believe someone in their article when they say they know the population percentage or they know the population mean. Chances are they don't. They just found a sample mean or a sample percentage and then they're just telling you it's the population. That's called point estimate. What we learn in this chapter is that every um, random sample is off from the population parameter. We call that margin of error. So margin of error is how far off is your sample statistic from your population parameter. So how far off is your sample mean from your population mean? How far off is your sample proportion from your population proportion? So this was, um, you know, some, a lot of thought went into how do we measure margin of error? Okay, well, one of the ways we did that, we usually measured margin of error by multiplying the critical value z-score or t-score times the standard error. If you remember, the standard error was the standard deviation of that sampling distribution we saw just a minute ago. So that's why, again, we take this standard error and we multiply by the critical value. The critical value, the z-score or the t-score, tells you how many standard errors away you should be to get the margin of error. So again, the critical value times the standard error gives you the margin of error. So margin of error is bigger than standard error. Usually it's about twice as big. So just kind of keep that in mind that margin of error and standard error are two very different things. Standard error really just focuses on one standard deviation away. So that's often called typical if it's normal. So this is kind of for typical, how far typical sample statistics might be off. Margin of error is more like the measure of how any sample statistic, how far, how far any sample statistic might be off. So margin of error is bigger than standard error. So once you have the margin of error, you can calculate a confidence interval, right? Two numbers that we think the population parameter is in between. So if you have one random sample, you, you're not going to be able to tell us what the population uh, mean or the population percentage is. We just don't know. 
uh, but we can find two numbers that we think that population mean or population percentage is in between. That's called a confidence interval. So usually to get a confidence interval, at least for means and proportions, we often uh, take the sample statistic, the sample mean or the sample proportion, and then we add and subtract the margin of error. So the sample statistic plus the margin of error gives us the top number, the upper limit, and the sample statistic minus the margin of error gives us the lower limit. Okay, and that's how we get two numbers that we think the population might be in between. Now, uh, in situations where you might not be able to use the formula because it does not meet assumptions or conditions for that formula to be accurate, they often use a, a technique called bootstrapping. Bootstrapping we'll talk about in a little bit, but that's another technique for creating a confidence interval. The nice part of that is it doesn't have as many assumptions. As long as you have a random sample um, and individuals independent, you can bootstrap usually. So we saw when we calculate confidence intervals, they come with something called a degree of confidence or a confidence level. So a confidence level is um, usually 95%. 95% is the most common one. Uh, again, this means that 95% of confidence intervals you make with that confidence level contain the population value and about 5% do not. So notice that sentence alone tells you that not all confidence intervals contain the population value. I usually ask that on an exam, true or false? All confidence intervals contain the population parameter, and that is false. We can see here that in a, at a 95% confidence, you're going to have 5% of the confidence intervals we make uh, with a 95% confidence will not contain the population value. In other words, the, the, the confidence interval um, did not uh, meet its purpose. Uh, we also have 90% confidence levels and 99% confidence levels. 90% uh, means that about 90% of confidence intervals will contain the population value and 10% will not. 99% confidence means 99% of confidence intervals we make contain the population parameter and about 1% do not. The one we usually use is 95. 95 is by far the most common, but sometimes you'll see 90 or 99. Now, one thing that's very interesting about these confidence levels is that what they do to the margin of error calculation. So these affect the critical values. They, correct, they affect the z-score or the t-score. So, um, is you if you have a 99% z-score or t-score that's going to be a much bigger critical value than a 90% 90% z-score or t-score is going to be smaller so that's going to make the margin of error smaller so 90% has a very small margin of error while 99% has a very big margin of error 95 is kind of in the middle so again 90% um, confidence you're going to have a very small margin of error. That's going to make the confidence interval upper and lower limit closer together. So this will be a very narrow confidence interval. 90%, think of it as a narrow confidence interval. 99% is a very big margin of error. So we're making a big margin of error because we want to be more confident that the population parameter is in between the two numbers. So that makes the confidence interval very wide. So think of confidence levels like a catcher's mitt, right? You want a 90%, you can get away with a small catcher's mitt, so the, the two numbers in the confidence interval are pretty close together, they're pretty narrow. If I want to be 99% confident that I catch the ball, I'm going to make, I'm going to have a really huge uh, catcher's mitt, and so I'm making the confidence interval very wide. I'm, I'm making the two numbers very far apart. That's the way it's more likely for the prop population value to be in between the two numbers. Okay, does that make sense? So we talked about bootstrapping. Uh, bootstrapping was a technique for uh, creating confidence intervals without a formula. It doesn't require as many assumptions. Um, the bootstrapping is taking many random sample values from one original random sample with replacement. So 
it is different than a sampling distribution. A sampling distribution will taking we're taking many random samples from the population. Okay, so we're taking many random samples from a population. Um, so think of it like taking lots of random samples from a census. That would be a sampling distribution. A bootstrap distribution, you're taking many random samples from a sample. So this is again, you in the real world, we only have one random sample usually. We don't have a census and we don't have a thousand random samples. We usually just have one. So we ask the computer to take random samples with replacement from that one real random sample. So we have one real random sample, we have the computer take random samples from the sample. But they always put the number back before they pick the next number. So that's what we call with replacement. And what that does is it sort of creates a simulated distribution. It almost looks like a sampling distribution. In fact, the standard error is about the same as we would get in a regular sampling distribution. The difference is it's not coming from the population. So the center of the, of the bootstrap distribution will just be the original real sample statistic. It won't be the population parameter. So in, in, in a, a regular sampling distribution, the middle, the center, is the population. But in a bootstrap, it's not. In a bootstrap, the center is just the sample statistic that we created the bootstrap from. But the, um, the shape of the bootstrap is very close to the sampling distribution and the standard error is very close to the sampling distribution. So we're able to judge variability and shape of, of our distribution from only one sample. So that's kind of neat. Okay, so, um, so let's go ahead and um, take a look at the bootstraps real quick. So here's our bootstraps. So these were Mustang, Mustangs, uh, Mustang cars, and we had a random sample of 25 Mustang cars. This was the original one, random sample. This is the real one. So in a bootstrap, you're taking samples from the sample. So we generate a thousand samples, and we um, from the sample. Now it'll always in a bootstrap, it'll always generate the samples as the same samples.